Thank you very much for um, attending uh, Central Global Interests uh, conference about um, the outlook for uh, Russian economy um, in 2015. Uh, we have two panels for you. Um, uh, the first one, we have two, uh, actually, we're supposed to have three. Uh, I think Maxim Trudelyev is running a little bit um, uh, late. Uh, but uh, to my left is uh, Sergei Alexashenko. He's a former Deputy Minister of Finance of Russia and former Deputy Governor of the Russian Central Bank. He's a former scholar and residence at the Carnegie Moscow uh, Center on Economic Policy Program. He's currently an independent consultant for Private Solutions, LLC. And to my further left is Anders Aslund, who has been a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute since 2006. He's previously worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, first as a senior associate, later as a director of the Russian Eurasian Program. He's also worked at the Brookings Institution and the Keenan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies. So uh, what we're going to do is um, each speaker is going to um, give about a 10 to 15 minute um, talk. As I've been informed, uh, Sergei is going to talk about how things are right now. And um, Anders is going to um, talk about how horrible everything is. <laughs> uh, and then we'll um, have a Q&A session um, afterwards. And then we'll have, uh, introduce our second uh, panel. Um, OK. So uh, Sergei, um, please, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Zatin. Uh, I, I hope that all of you know that it is it okay. No, no. No. So one, one, one. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be uh, close. Wow, uh, even closer. Uh, uh, those of you who are watching the Russian economy have heard about tremendous developments uh, in the Russian financial market in mid December when a ruble collapsed virtually by 50% in several minutes. And uh, there are a number of rumors in the uh, uh, expert community that how far Russian economy will, will fall down, how fast Russian economy will fall down, and how serious will be the collapse of the Russian economy. Uh, I, I don't like the economic system created by uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. I think it is extremely inefficient. I, extreme, I think it is very corruptive. I think it's very crony-oriented. Uh, Nevertheless, my general approach to the Russian uh, situation is that Russian economy is much more stable than we believe to think. And there is much less uh, interconnection between financial markets, financial developments, uh, and the real sector of the economy in, the, in Russia, rather than, for example, in Europe or in the United States. And uh, I want uh, I, 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 I usually I don't like to predict that okay in three months something will happen or in six months Russian economy will collapse by 10 percent by 15 percent by 25 percent nobody knows nobody knows I try to look on the real facts that we have today and to understand does it help us to predict can we say that up to now Russian economy is on the verge of collapse or maybe a collapse has started and we have just to say, yes, it's going down, it's falling down, it's free fall. And uh, I, I, will start, I will start with general GDP uh, dynamics. There is no data for the uh, fourth quarter. There is no uh, data for the year 2014 overall. But nevertheless, by the end of the third quarter, Russian economy was steadily declining. And uh, from levels of 4% uh, annualized growth somewhere in mid-2011, uh, it went up to zero, maybe slightly positive, at, at the third quarter of the last year. So up to now, there is no any indication in GDP dynamics that Russian economy even is in recession. There, are, there were some preliminary estimates of Minister of Economy saying we estimate that in fourth quarter there will be a decline. Nevertheless, uh, yesterday there were published data on industrial production that were enormously strong, enormously positive, and I think it was a surprise for many experts. Uh, if uh, we compare, uh, many, many of us may remember the crisis of 2008. It was not so long ago, just uh, six years. And if we compare the situation of uh, six years ago and today, I have to say that the situation today is much more better. For example, uh, in November 2008, 
compared to November 2007, industrial production declined by 8.5%. Declined in November. This year, November was minus 0.4, while December was plus 3.9%. December 2008 to December 2007, industrial production was, has declined by more than 10%. So definitely we have to say that there is no anything similar in industrial production. The next very important factor for the Russian economy that demonstrates a lot how, what's going on is the railway freight turnover. Uh, in fact, yeah, I remember the situation of uh, autumn 2008, and it was the first uh, data that emerged when uh, chairman of Russian Railways, Mr. Yakunin, said, look, the turnover in Russian Railways collapsed by more than 10% in November and by 20% in December. This year, uh, railway turnover is plus 3% compared to 2013. So, what is going on in the real sector, at least in industrial material production, does not demonstrate any decline, that does not demonstrate collapse, and uh, that does not demonstrate recession. What really is worse, uh, what is much worse than it was in uh, six years ago, it is investment. Uh, in November 2008 to November 2007, investment were, were still growing. It was plus 4%. This year it is minus 5%. So the, the, the nature of the Russian price is what are we, if we put away oil price, if we put away uh, Western oil sanctions, if we put away uh, exchange rate of the ruble, the real prices in the Russian economy started maybe two, two and a half years ago, it is declining in investment. And 2013 there was zero growth in investment, 2014 it is minus 5%, and that is, that is the nature, that is long-lasting uh, crisis, and it's much more severe than it was six years ago. Statistics of households incomes, uh, once again, it, was, it is much positive today, though I do not trust a lot to Rostat data because uh, they have very specific methodology accounting purchases and sale of foreign exchanges, incomes and expenditures. So nevertheless, if we take the data of Rostat, in um, December 2008, decline of private households, was, uh, incomes was more than 10%, nowadays it's 5%. Uh, as I said, as I said uh, yesterday's data demonstrated that industrial production grew by uh, virtually 3.9 percent Dece December to December and 1.7 percent 2014 to 2013. On the one hand, it is uh, uh, it is a surprise. On the other hand, I uh, I stated a hypothesis uh, several months ago that uh, this growth is dominantly exp may be explained by military production. So that is the data that you cannot find in Rostat data. Rostat does not pu publish any data on military production. Nevertheless, I found, I discovered some data on, um, uh, on uh, in, uh, Itartas website. And it is not about uh, 2014 to 2013, it is 15 to 14. But I remember from my previous life in uh, United Aircraft Corporation that numbers should be, growth numbers should be virtually the same. For example, number of tanks that were produced, tanks and armored machines produced in 2014 was 600. In 2015, it will be 700. The number of um, military uh, surface uh, ships, I don't know how, yeah, it was zero in 2014, it will be five in 2015. Military aircraft, 115, 126. Uh, missile rockets, 38 2014, 50 2015. So we see a rather big uh, growth uh, of military production, 50 to 20 percent in different positions that are available. And of course, military, uh, military production complex is very important uh, uh, sector of Russian manufacturing. And of course, it causes the growth in uh, many uh, sectors, connect, in interconnected sectors. So, and I, I believe that industrial production is is supported by military production at the moment, and uh, as uh, budgetary financing for the military complex will not be reduced in 2015, at least uh, as, as of today, uh, President Putin said that we should not cut military expenditures. So that means that military production in 2015 will grow once again another 15 to 20 percent. Uh, what what what? can explain us dynamics in uh, 2015, economic dynamics in 2015, is of course the development with the exchange rate of the ruble. The uh, ruble has collapsed, and more, more, more important is that Russian export proceeds has collapsed. 
Uh, I think we, have, we agree with Anders that uh, Russia has to absorb significantly, uh, a, a very significant adjustment of import, of balance of payments. By different estimates, the decline in import could be from 40 to 60 percent, depending on how much of foreign exchange reserves a Russian central bank will spend. Up to now, up to now, and the data, the data from the first quarter of 2015 demonstrates that there was no such an adjustment. Uh, the decline in import in, to, in the last quarter of the previous year was only minus uh, 16%, and that means much more to come. Decline in import means that a decline in wholesale trade, in foreign trade, decline in uh, revenues of the federal budget, and a decline in consumption, and what is much more important, definitely it will be decline in investment. Uh, Russian, Russian, Russian economy uh, imports a lot of industrial equipment from different sectors, and of course, uh, as ruble devalued, all import became much more uh, expensive, and many investment projects, more uh, in the sectors that are oriented on domestic industries, they will uh, be uh, short in cash. They will not be able to finance. They will not be able to purchase equipment. They will not be able to uh, pay contracts, and that means that. Uh, in, my, in my view, in my view, the most serious problem of 2015 will be further decline in investment, uh, because uh, on the one hand, budget. Uh, one more problem, one, more, one more issue. Just uh, a week ago, Minister of Finance has published uh, preliminary estimates of the federal budget execution for the last year, and uh, budget was executed with revenues virtually uh, as planned. So, no indication, no indication that. Uh, the revenues of, of the federal budget are, are less than we have projected. The only one tax that is really uh, le significantly less than it was projected it is profit tax, but profit tax is a tax with going to regional budgets. So federal budget does not feel at the moment the decline uh, of uh, uh, any economic decline. Its revenues are well uh, well in, in the past. And, and but regional budgets will will do it. So budget, uh, the anti-crisis program of the government is very funny because they decided not to spend extra money. They decided to cut some expenditures in the budget by 10 percent, except of military and social, and to redistribute those money. In fact, this is redistribution. It is not. It is not uh, new money. New, new, it's not softening of the budgetary policy. It's not support of the of the demand. And with inflation that is high, that means that real expenditures of the budget will decline. And uh, uh, as many of you can imagine, that it is much easier to cut investment rather than any other current expenditures. So budget, federal budget, cut investment, cuts investment. Many uh, private companies they cut investment, be cut investment because of the exchange rate of the ruble, and that will be. And the Russian balance of payment should adjust, absorb all this, and that will be. It's unpredictable how by how much, yeah, and it is unpredictable how fast uh, Russian economy could demonstrate in numbers th th this decline in investment will result in GDP dynamics, but definitely it will. Definitely it will, and uh, my anticipation is that we will see results in GDP dynamics in 2015 and 2016. So what is what was not imported or what was imported in 2014 will be used in uh, investment process in 2015, while all cuts uh, in investments in, in investment import in 2015 they will result in dynamics in 2016. Uh, Investment are really bad, are really bad, and uh, at the moment uh, they fell to the level of the uh, medium. Uh, after, after the crisis, they have recovered, and by uh, beginning of 2012, they were approximately plus five percent above medium level of 2008. Now, nowadays, the investment has declined, and Russia is back to 2008 level. One, one more strange story. One more strange story. One, I, I'm not. Uh, why I, I do not, I do not uh, support the idea of immediate collapse and very fast collapse of the Russian economy. It is a Russian uh, household behavior. Uh, I looked uh, ru ru Russian, Russian economic, uh, Russian households. They are economically, uh, they behave themselves like economically educated. Maybe sometimes many of them they have no any education at all, economic education, financial education. Nevertheless. In, in general, their behavior is economic uh, is theoretically uh, supported. 
and uh, until until November, until November, the last data we have for November, well, the number and the amount of mortgage credit uh, credits loans uh, by Russian households was growing, and was growing by 15 to 20 percent faster than the year ago. In 2008. Uh, the decline, the decline in mortgages started in the fourth quarter, started in November 2008, and it was rather significant. Nevertheless, uh, the uh, since uh, the last six years, a lot of transformation took place uh, in uh, house and construction, and uh, if by crisis of 2008. Uh, developers, they financed the bulk of the construction by loans that they took themselves uh, from the banks. Nowadays, the bulk of construction is financed by mortgage loans. So it, if households took credits, if they paid uh, to developers, that means the construction will go on. So that uh, th that is a, that is a machine. I, I, I cannot predict, I, I, I anticipate, I anticipate that sooner or later, maybe it will be December data or even January data, when the number of mortgages will, will stop to grow, and uh, so maybe maybe it will even uh, it should decline. It should decline sooner or later. Nevertheless, up to now, this machine construction machine in house uh, in household uh, house uh, house construction house in construction uh, continue to work and continue to produce result. And the very the very last uh, the very last point, uh, uh, my colleagues in the development center uh, in Moscow. They uh, do such uh, calculations of the cyclical indexes. Uh, it's like leading indicators that demonstrate how economy could or can can go on further. And uh, uh, I, I, unfortunately, we have no we have no this um, PowerPoint projection. But it looks like this. And if someone can see, there was a steep decline in 2008. <coughs> And then a steady decline up to now. So my general forecast, or my general anticipation of the of the nature of the of the speed of the Russian crisis, our Russian economic decline uh, in this crisis, will be not as steep uh, immediately, not as fast, but very long-lasting and very slow and consecutive. It will be very difficult for Russian government, for Russian authorities, to revert this trend because it is based on some institutional uh, problems. And first of all, it is property rights protection. First of all, it is uh, dependence of the courts that do not pr protect uh, private property. And the uh, Russian government is not looking to change anything in this area. The, the anti-crisis plan, as I said, it is just redistribution of budgetary money, and it will not help the economy. So it will be a long-lasting crisis. It will be a slow crisis. It will be a steady decline. But I. I cannot support at the moment the idea that it will be a free fall by 10% left this year. Thank you. In case you can. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, offers uh, quite a clear contrast to what I'm going to tell you, and uh, this is the very point. What Sergei has uh, presented to you, this is uh, how the forecasts are normally done. You look up on what has happened, w what is the next, and you draw, draw it out a little bit more. Most of the time that works very well, but this technique never functions when we come to a real crisis. Uh, nobody uh, really predicted in this fashion uh, the crisis that happened in 2008 anywhere in the world. And uh, my argument to you today is that we are, for Russia, in a similar uh, crisis. And uh, in order to understand that, I think it's much more useful to look up on a few major indicators that have really changed quite substantially and uh, uh, are all decisive. And what I want to uh, discuss with you are four issues. One is general economic policy, which gives the basis for economic growth. The second is uh, the oil price. The third is the financial sanctions. And the fourth is the nature of the policy making uh, today in, in Russia. And I will argue that all four are considerably worse than in 2008. Therefore, we should expect a worse outcome. In September uh, 2008, uh, the Russian economy was booming. The general expectation for the next year was a growth of 8%. President Putin. Uh, uh, let's see, he was already Prime Minister Putin then, in uh, September 2008, made a famous speech 
about uh, Russia as the safe haven in the midst of a global financial crisis that uh, did not go down very well. Uh, I thought that it was somewhat uh, flawed, so I wrote two articles uh, then arguing that uh, uh, the GDP next year can as well fall by 8% eight, eight as uh, grow by 8%. It's wrong, more likely that it will fall by 8%, and that happened to be the outcome. Uh, so this uh, shows uh, how uh, poor ordinary macroeconomic uh, forecasts are. For next year, uh, depending on what forecast you uh, see, I think that Sergei is, uh, in his wording here, just about the most optimistic. I don't know if you landed on a number for next year. No. No. But uh, you can say that the pessimistic forecasts are the Central Bank of Russia, four and a half to uh, five percent uh, uh, GDP decline if the oil price is um, uh, sixty dollars. Uh, hardly anybody is more pessimistic uh, than that. I would rather think that the GDP will uh, fall by ten percent next year. And let me give you the reasons. What we are seeing in terms of structural policy is that uh, uh, the Rush, uh, President Putin has now really established a kleptocracy. I think that Canada wishes uh, a book, uh, Putin's kleptocracy, will be the document how we look up on the Russian uh, economy. But this is a combination of organized uh, crime and uh, um, uh, old KGB uh, networks that have taken over the economy. And there's, of course, nothing uh, connected with economic efficiency in that. Uh, and to, uh, I look uh, now at the market value of uh, Gazprom yesterday, $51 billion. In May 2008, it was 369 So it has fallen uh, uh, seven, eight times uh, since that time. And uh, 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 Gazprom is, of course, the most important company in Russia. If you mismanage the most important uh, piece so much, and we are now seeing Rosneft as uh, the new de destroyer of the Russian economy. And interestingly, this is what President Putin particularly supports. So uh, Rosneft, uh, two years ago, bought um, uh, TNK BP, the best big oil company in the world. It was pretty much a force to purchase uh, for a net $40 billion. These $40 billion that were brought in in short-term financing are now the major destabilizer of the uh, uh, Russian exchange market. And uh, that keeps uh, going on. So Rosneft is what you should look up on if you want to see uh, how badly the Russian economy is uh, going. When Rosneft had taken over TNKVP, the 1,500 top managers in TNKVP the best oil managers in Russia walked out because there was no need for them and they, uh, they were not uh, desired any longer. Probably most of them have, uh, have emigrated uh, at uh, this stage. This is no way to run economic policy. The purpose of uh, Putin's economic policy is state and crony capitalism. This means that the uh, output capacity in Russia today is perhaps 1% growth a year to begin with, and uh, the capacity utilization is full. As we see inflation uh, right now, 12, 13% <coughs> year over year, and uh, unemployment down to 5%. So there is no free capacity. And uh, uh, as Sergei so rightly pointed out, uh, investment has already uh, started falling. That's the first point. The second point is the oil prices. Uh, and here it depends on your outlook uh, of uh, oil prices. I'm very much a person who believes in long cycles. We had a high uh, price cycle, uh, 73 to 1980. After that, we had uh, 20 years of low oil prices. Now we have had uh, uh, slightly more than a decade of high oil prices. Now they have fallen, and then we should expect them to fall for long. The reasons are, on the production side, Investments are largely long-term. There are some exceptions, but they are small. Uh, shale, uh, oil and gas in the US is one of the exceptions. In most cases, you have big investment for a long time. 
uh, think of drilling uh, deep water oil when you see how long term uh, uh, much of oil production is. So uh, if prices fall, you look up on the current cost and not on the uh, to, uh, average cost, and you find that you need to produce more if the prices are lowering in order to cover uh, your, your capital uh, cost. On the consumption side, this was the big surprise in the 1980s that the Western world could save so much energy. If you have put in double glazed windows in your house, you don't take them out because the energy is cheaper. If you have installed a modern electrical uh, uh, steel <coughs> uh, uh, producing furnace, you don't take it out and go back to an open blast furnace that uses five times more energy because energy is cheap. So m m many of these energy savings, they are a stick regardless of uh, uh, what, uh, what happens. So therefore, I think that we are in a period of, uh, and we have a whole uh, energy revolution now. We have uh, uh, shale and um, uh, uh, sh shale gas and uh, shale oil, and uh, uh, solar and wind energy becoming ever cheaper. So uh, we have all reasons to believe that there will be a long period of low energy prices. And let us say fifty dollars per barrel, as it happens to be the case. Of course, we can't predict. Uh, with any uh, precision, but that uh, seems reasonable. That means that oil prices will be half of what they have been last year and for the last several years, or slightly less. Uh, Russia's uh, uh, export uh, in 2013 consisted to 68% of oil and gas, and it has been about two thirds for, for many years. Uh, given that the oil price has fallen so much, it means that one third of Russia's export is gone. And for the rest, the export is pretty constant because the, it's only price variations. Uh, the export has been just over $500 billion for the last four years. So there's no dynamism in the Russian economy in that regard. And now uh, one third is gone. And as uh, Sergei mentioned, this means that uh, imports will fall by about half. Uh, because Russia has a big uh, trade surplus that it needs for a number of reasons. Uh, remittance is a big uh, service, uh, imbalanced, large, uh, uh, steady uh, capital uh, outflows for uh, various reasons. And what does it mean that half of the import uh, disappears? Well, with the oil price, uh, the ruble falls. The exchange rate policy now is floating exchange rate, and we're seeing empirically that uh, the oil price and the a ruble go very closely, so we can expect that the ruble, the real ruble exchange rate, will be approximately half of what it has been in relation to the dollar, and uh, that means that imports cost twice as much. And who's, uh, what happens then when the import uh, uh, costs uh, uh, double? Well, two big things happen. One is that Russians are likely to import manufacturers from cheaper countries not from Europe, that now delivers uh, half uh, the exports to Russia, but from India, China, Indonesia, uh, which uh, produce um, competitive goods that are of lower quality but, uh, but cheaper. And uh, the other is, if you look up on food imports, which are not very large, they will uh, 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 stay at the international level because these uh, uh, food commodities uh, tend to have international prices. So they will double. What we saw last year already was that the, what increased most in price was buckwheat by 70%, Kriechka. And um, we're now seeing that the food prices uh, uh, for staples uh, increased twice as much as the average uh, inflation. So this will hit uh, on the standard of living which is something that uh, President Putin seems to pay a lot of attention uh, to. And uh, uh, moving on then uh, to, uh, so this will be a big damage, and the question is how. And then I want to connect with a third factor, which is the financial sanctions. The financial sanctions have become far more serious than anybody inside or outside of Russia expected. And the reason is Dodd-Frank. 
uh, it means that the US financial regulators have now be become extremely stiff. If you talk with international bankers, they dare not do business with Russia, by and large. So I talked to one chap who does uh, uh, East European business uh, last week, and he said, you can't imagine what an awful life I have. I have to spend two hours every day with our compliance officers, and I don't even do Russia. I only do Eastern Europe. But then it turns out that there's some Russian element in it, and then we can't do it. So this uh, is the situation that international bankers have. So um, what's, uh, you remember uh, uh, in the th uh, third quarter last people discussed that uh, the sanctions uh, will not hold there are too many loopholes in them. Well, Dodd-Frank has tightened these loopholes so that the, uh, everybody's scared of the US financial uh, inspectors. Not even the Chinese state banks have dared to deliver to Russia the financing that we had promised uh, uh, to Putin in May for building this uh, Sila, uh, Siberia uh, gas pipeline from Russia to, uh, uh, to China. So uh, th this means that we are seeing a steady uh, reduction of uh, the reserves. And this is really a li liquidity freeze, exactly as was the case in 2008-2009. Um, in uh, and it gets worse and worse. We saw last year that uh, uh, the net uh, official reserves reduced, uh, were reduced by $125 billion. Out of the reserves, now only $170 billion are liquid and held by the central banks. About as much is being held in sovereign wealth funds, but they are held by the Ministry of Finance and are supposed to be used for various purposes. A small part of it now uh, for this uh, anti-crisis uh, program that uh, Sergei uh, dis uh, discussed. And uh, the consequence is that the government uh, gets more and more tied with the reserves. And the uh, obligations are to pay out uh, about $100 billion in the debt obligations over the year. So I think that this, together with a low oil price, will put uh, Russia in a very, very tight spot. And then we come to uh, uh, sum up what that would mean. Uh, Sergey mentioned now uh, investment going down 5% this year. In this kind of uh, capital crunch that we are seeing, it would be reasonable to expect a decline in investment of 25 30%. This is what we normally see in this kind of uh, capital crunch uh, situation. And uh, uh, then that would mean a decline in GDP of 5 to 6%, because investment is almost 20% of uh, GDP as it is. The rest of GDP is uh, consumption in one way or the other, I include the military there, but that is not much. Uh, and 80%, um, and what will happen with that? I see here that uh, uh, household real disposable uh, money income uh, decreased uh, uh, in November 2014 uh, with 4.7% in comparison with November uh, 2013. This will get worse. The, the, the money is not there. The uh, Minister of Finance is now cutting 10% uh, nominally on all uh, public expenditure but uh, defence. And uh, that will hit standard of living. It will hit consumption, public and private consumption. I think that uh, to assume a 6% decline in consumption would be uh, quite moderate. We could take the uh, still one of number of 10% uh, instead. But if we stick to 6% as a moderate number, well, out of 80% of GDP, that would be uh, a decline in GDP of 4.8%. And the two numbers, declining investment and declining uh, consumption, uh, the uh, net exports, I presume, will be the same. <coughs> Uh, so that has no impact, uh, then we would get uh, about 10% decline in GDP. If the consumption instead falls by 10%, then we would see a decline in GDP of 13-14% uh, of GDP.
I think this is the ballpark. These are new exact uh, predictions. I can't know how much uh, consumption or investment can fall, uh, will fall, but I can say that they will fall substantially in this kind of environment because uh, the, uh, the financial resources are not there. Uh, and the oil price and the financial uh, sanctions will bite ever more. And then I come to my fourth element, and that is the policy making. What has not been much discussed, I had an article about the projects in the a um, couple of weeks ago, is that, uh, uh, put it in the Nile, it's called, uh, is that policy making has really broken down in Russia. The Russian government looks like a number of stove pipes. Uh, and the problem here is that the prime minister is in the Russian <coughs> system the chief economist. And uh, uh, Dmitry Medvedev is not allowed to fill that role. So if you saw here on the 21st of uh, uh, January, uh, uh, President Putin had a, a, a meeting on the anti-crisis program that he approved the day before yesterday and now it's going through the Duma today. And as far as I could see, the Prime Minister was not there. At least he was not speaking. So who spoke? The Minister of Economy and the First Deputy uh, Prime Minister Igor, uh, Igor Shovalov. And that means that uh, there's no coordination. It's uh, uh, decisions are persistently taken and it's also typical that it took place in Putin's residence in uh, Novia Garyova and not uh, in the uh, government buildings in, in the center of, uh, of uh, Moscow because Putin doesn't like going to Moscow. So <clears throat> this is no way of running a government. It's no way of running a, 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 a policy making. We can also see that the central bank has limited resources to intervene with the Minister of Finance into uh, beings on its own, and the, uh, the five biggest state uh, exporters are told to intervene in the uh, 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 currency market. This is no way of intervening in the ca currency markets. That's why you want one institution, the central bank, in each country to be in charge of it. And what is the result? Well, one day the ruble jumps up by 4%, and the other day uh, down by 5%. And uh, so this is really that the policy making itself is destabilizing the situation. And uh, here now there is an anti-crisis program, how is this done? Uh, Putin has uh, repeatedly said that we know how to handle crisis. We know that they all, the, the causes always come from the outside. It was uh, like that in 2008, and it's uh, the same now again. So I'm perfect, uh, we are not guilty. And he says, we know how to do it. Well, among the G20 countries, Russia had the biggest fall in 2009 because it handled the crisis the worst. And uh, uh, now Putin wants to repeat that because it was such a successful policy. So uh, there's no sense of any perspective uh, on it, and uh, this is not likely to work very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions for uh, for both of you. For um, Andres, um, I know uh, most people kind of say that uh, 700 billion dollars of um, debt taken on by Russian companies um, and now that they're having a hard time um, refinancing. What do you think, how serious is this debt crisis and what are we likely to see in the future uh, happen um, with this debt? And also if you could quickly uh, mention because uh, a lot of people have been mentioning SWIFT, um, that Russia perhaps might be um, disconnected from the SWIFT uh, payment system. What effect will that likely have if that happens? And uh, for Sergei, um, this uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, seems to have already been divided among uh, uh, Russia's large and uh, largely unofficial, um, oh, sorry, inefficient companies. Oh, um, <coughs> is there any attempt by the government to support medium and small size business in Russia? And if not, uh, what is the future for medium and small business um, in Russia? as well as uh, mortgages, um, how much of the mortgages taken out by Russians is in hard currency and are we likely to see a uh, default on a lot of these mortgages and also its effect on the economy? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. On the debt, uh, well, the total Russian uh, foreign debt now, private and uh, uh, public, uh, uh, corporate and state, is uh, down now below $600 billion. And then normally you compare this with GDP. Uh, a year ago, Russia's GDP in current dollars was 2.1 trillion, according to the IMF. Uh, now, because of the devaluation, the GDP in current dollars is down to 1.25 trillion dollars. So th this makes a lot of difference. So you can say 600 billion to uh, 2.1. It's uh, less than one third. It's uh, pretty trivial in terms of foreign indebtedness. Uh, 600 billion in term to 1.2. That's 50 percent, still low but it's a, it's a bit more. But uh, the point is that um, normally we discuss sol is it a solvency or a liquidity problem. Uh, because of the f financial sanctions, uh, it doesn't matter that Russia is uh, solvent because it can't get the funding. Uh, and uh, uh, that makes it much worse. So here we have $380 billion of total uh, 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 reserves of the government and $600 billion of debt. And the only thing that matters is that $600 billion is, uh, is, uh, uh, is more. And this puts Russia in a, a, tight, a tight situation. So when taking this debt, that was basically quite prudent. Uh, but when you, uh, the large chunks of debt here are uh, uh, Gazprom and Rosneft. And in particular, Rosneft, uh, which uh, used to have a, a, a foreign indebtedness in the order of $70 billion, and has a value now of something like $35 billion, doesn't look, uh, market capitalization does not look um, uh, very good. But uh, as a sum for the country, that was not. Uh, with regard to SWIFT, uh, uh, Iran is off the SWIFT. And, um, it does complicate foreign payment. I'll pass that on to Sergei as a, a banker. Uh, he doesn't think that it's very dangerous, but um, it would seriously complicate uh, all payments uh, with Russia. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, three questions uh, on SWIFT. Uh, uh, many of you know, remember, what does it mean fixed line, fixed phones? Yeah? The difference between SWIFT and non-SWIFT is mobile phones and fixed line phones. Can we live without mobiles? Yes, we can. It is a little bit complicated. We have to adjust ourselves, but still it's possible. It will increase transaction costs for the business sector. You have to ch exchange information with your correspondent banks uh, in dollars or in euros by fax or by telex. Uh, you have to pay your correspondent banks for because it will increase uh, jobs in the, for them. But it's not a disaster. It is not comfortable. It is not comfortable, definitely. But it's not a collapse, and it's not it's not a prohibition to make any payments. It's it's not a, uh, any uh, significant disruption of payments. It will be longer and more expensive. On sovereign funds, um, approximately uh, thirty to forty percent, uh, depending on the time when it will be spent, are distributed between uh, biggest corporations. Uh, at the moment, government does not plan spend any significant resources to support small and medium business. Nevertheless, in the anti-crisis plan that was published today, uh, there are some items that allows uh, the government plans to uh, 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 draft the legislation that allows regions to reduce profit tax for small business, and uh, they increase the standards uh, for individual businesses. Uh, government plans to reduce some regulation burden. But it is not uh, in money. You cannot calculate it in money. On mortgages, uh, Rus after the crisis of 2008, uh, Russian households, uh, before that, uh, the ratio, the share of uh, foreign exchange mortgages was up to 20%. Nowadays, it is below 7%. And the default, it's a surprise, but the default, uh, default rate uh, on mortgages uh, declines steadily. It was about slightly above 3% in 2008. Nowadays, it is below 2%. So Russian households are, Russia prudent, r r households are Russia rather prudent in their payments, and they do not violate mortgages, at least up to now. Thank you.
And uh, Max Togodalibov uh, is here. And um, as an expert kind of on the Russian, some of the uh, more Russian in internal dynamics, um, how do you see the development of a small and medium business um, in Russia? Um, as well, I, I know you're an expert in property rights. Uh, how is this uh, current crisis going to affect uh, property rights, if at all? Thank you. Um, thank you. I apologize for being late. That's uh, some kind of misunderstanding between. Uh, um, well, it's uh, well. It's interesting that, that, that you mention uh, property rights. Uh, that's probably fundamental to uh, uh, to any uh, institutional uh, sort of system, institutional framework for any country. And in Russia's case, it's uh, it has always been a sort of a a, um, a problematic, uh, uh, problematic sphere. Um, what I think uh, happened, basically, has happened already, uh, is that Russia, before let's say before Crimea, before last year, had a certain very convenient arrangement for most businesses who could use foreign institutions. In fact, uh, they were, in effect, encouraged to do that by the state. Uh, there were no uh, um, punishment for, for, essentially, for using the incorporation services as the legal services of other countries, uh, incorporating your company in uh, offshore jurisdictions, especially the jurisdictions that specialize in offering that kind of services. Starting with Cyprus is the probably primary uh, destination for uh, Russian businesses, and if you look at uh, foreign direct investment flows, you will see that Cyprus, for many many ye years, topped the list. Which means that it's basically round tripping of assets between Russia and uh, these jurisdictions. Anyway, so that was an, a very convenient arrangement that allowed the Russian state and the, the Russian government to keep Russia's own legal framework for business underdeveloped. It's very convenient because if you want to keep control, if you want to use the assets of your especially big businesses the way uh, the Kremlin has been doing for years and years, you don't need, you actually don't want to have a developed, a highly developed system of um, protection of property rights and other rights, for that matter. Uh, so that convenient arrangement is um, under a big question mark right now. Uh, most businesses remain incorporated outside Russia, but uh, it. I'm not sure that. Um, the Kremlin has really thought it through uh, what will happen when uh, Russia basically now is in direct conflict with uh, Western institutions, including uh, the, the very institutions of whom, from whom that, that arrangement actually depends, uh, banks in, in, in large part. And uh, we've seen that um, the story of uh, Vladimir Yevtushenkov, who uh, had to uh, essentially uh, give up uh, part of uh, assets, that uh, a significant amount of assets, uh, the, com the oil company Bashneft, uh, to the state uh, to remain um, uh, sort of a functioning businessman. And uh, that's the kind of arrangement that we see, and uh, we will probably see more of that. Um, and, of course, the, the Kremlin has now reinforced its position as the sort of ultimate, uh, ultimate owner of uh, large assets that are essential for the functioning of the Russian state. And the interesting part, the sort of the most significant part of that is, is that no one knows exactly where that sphere of influence actually ends, because, I mean, obviously the, the, the strategic assets and uh, the Kremlin has long been uh, doing this. They had, had a list of assets that they call strategic. Uh, it's a long list, but it's sort of a, uh, it's a definitive sort of number of things. But 
uh, we don't know whether that list is a, is actually where it ends. Uh, probably uh, on the sort of on the other extreme, people owning their apartments that won't be affected. I don't think. Uh, but anything in between, uh, an oil, a big oil company or a, an oil company, and a, a person's uh, apartment, there's a huge uh, distance. And where uh, where is the sort of the limit of where property rights are defended, are protected? Um, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's really unclear, and uh, this is where we are. And this is actually the essence, the fundamental reason why we cannot really expect uh, the Russian economy to pick up suddenly, even if you give people um, incredible tax uh, incredible tax breaks right now, uh, because the actual uh, uh, tax is one thing, but uh, the, the institutional framework is, is fundamental and it's more important. And it's sort of in flux. Uh, it's, it's changing right now as we speak. So uh, I don't think we, we are actually in, in a position to discuss uh, the future of medium and small businesses. They will be around because people are there. People will, I mean, we will, <laughs> we will live there, we will work there, so people will buy and sell. But how that will develop is, is really unclear. Uh, and so we'll open that up to uh, questions. Uh, please state your affiliation. And uh, if you could please uh, keep uh, it to a question, not a comment. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Knowlton. I teach uh, political science at Flagler College. I've been reading some of the works, uh, articles, and uh, books by uh, Murray Feshbach. I'd like uh, particularly Dr. Aslan to comment on Russian demographics, uh, the high accident rates, the morbidity rates, uh, among particularly working age males, alcoholism, how that you see that affecting the economy in the longer term. Uh, thank you. Well, Mary Feshbank has a lot, uh, done a lot of important and uh, good, uh, good work. Uh, uh, the big thing we are seeing now is uh, that uh, the uh, labor force will be declining by about 1% a year because of uh, simply that uh, the, the nature of the uh, population uh, pyramid. And with regard to uh, smoking and uh, alcoholism, uh, there has been some improvement in recent years, and at least the Russian government now is pursuing campaigns against these. So I think that this is something that we have seen the worst of, and I'm not quite sure how much, uh, is it 63 or 64 years uh, of age now, the May life expectancy, while it was down to slightly below 58 in uh, 94 when it hit the bottom. But it was quite uh, sad to see that for a long time it stayed around 60, but it has started improving in uh, uh, recent years. Uh, but uh, another question here, what uh, Russia really should do with regard to the labor force is uh, to carry out the proper uh, uh, pension reform. And President Putin so far is adamant on not raising the retirement age. So it stays 55 for women and uh, 60 for men which is, of course, uh, uh, f far too, uh, 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 too low. But um, it's popular to, to keep it there, so therefore he insists on uh, doing it. So. Um, I'm Eleanor Bachrach. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Eleanor Bachrach. I uh, spent uh, several years working uh, for USAID and Ukraine. Um, so I have some knowledge of the area. Uh, Putin announced uh, several months ago a, a ban on input, food imports uh, from a number of countries. I don't know how much this has uh, held up, been enforced. It struck me as a wonderful way to shoot himself in the foot. Uh, 
because when he says Russia is used to dealing with these situations, I think he means that people are used to uh, uh, hardship, uh, putting up with hardships. But I wonder um, whether what effect this uh, is likely to have. You on the you talked about the rise in food prices, and is this likely to have a political impact as well? Uh, Russian inflation uh, has risen from 6.5 percent last year to 11, uh, 2013 uh, to 11.4 percent 2014, and it's continued to grow. And my personal forecast that inflation, uh, 12 months moving average, moving inflation will reach 15 percent by the end of this quarter, of the first quarter, and it may reach up to 20 percent by the middle of the year. So there are the inflation. Inflation is a result of two factors, two main factors. First is devaluation of the ruble because a bigger share of consumption is imported, and the other is food ban. Uh, President Putin has imposed a ban on uh, food import from uh, European countries: United States, Canada, and Australia, New Zealand, seems to be Norway, and uh, it was imposed in the beginning of August. And the overall assessment that it add, this, this decision added uh, something like a 1.5 to 2 percentage point of inflation uh, for the last year. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, and uh, we, we, it's, it's statistics. It's statistics. It's, it provided some boost for domestic uh, food industry uh, in, in some sectors. In some sectors like cheese production, dairy products. Uh, in, in autumn, the growth of Russian industry was up to 10 to 15 percent. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, on statistics, on general statistics, it's inflation, but in some particular businesses, it's growth. I guess the import or uh, the rise of uh, Belarusian Parmesan is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm Harley Balzer from Georgetown University. Uh, two questions, uh, primarily Sergey, but anyone really. Uh, one, uh, the role of corruption. Uh, somehow it, it's hard to imagine it decreasing in the current climate. Uh, if you read Pomerantsev's new book, uh, the destruction of small and medium businesses is pretty egregious. Uh, if you go see Leviathan, uh, even housing property isn't safe. Uh, should we expect that to some heavy curtailed? Is it going to get worse? And the other question is uh, a number of people, including Vladimir Mao, have talked about the crisis possibly being a good thing because it will allow Russia to reform and carry out import substitution. Uh, any evidence at all that any of this is happening? Uh, I didn't see any indications of it in the, the new anti crisis plan. Uh, on corruption, thank you for the questions. Uh, on corruption, uh, in the West, in the West, uh, there is a wide uh, term corruption that, in fact, is not corruption in Russia. Uh, no, the Russian corruption is not what you mean by corruption in the West. Uh, normally, normally, corruption is like something like a kickback. You pay to the government official a certain bribe to get some orders from the government. Yeah, to, 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 to get, to get some, some benefit, economic contracts from the government. Uh, when we discuss property rights, and that is the most severe part of the Russian business, it's not corruption. In Western terms, it's racketeering. No, that's true. You have to pay policemen, you have to pay, pay, to pay firemen, you have to pay tax authority, custom authorities, the bribe, in order to keep your business alive. It's racketeering. You do not get any any contracts from them. They do not provide you any additional services, faster or safer or you know, better. Yeah, uh, you pay because you otherwise you can face a criminal investigation against you and your business will be closed. According to statistics, uh, in 94 percent of cases, when there is a criminal investigation against the businessman, the business is going to be destroyed or to change the owner. The most well-known uh, element of Russian this corruption racketeering is just uh, sharing the pro sharing the property. You run a business, and one day policeman, I don't know, FSB, KGB officer, or someone else uh, comes to you and say, "Look, you have to give me twenty-five percent of your business." 
and this is your choice. Either you do it or you say go to hell. If you say go to hell, next day you're in prison and your business is gone. If you give 25%, next year he will come once again and say, please give me another 25. Is it corruption? It's not. And that is that is that what we, we when we discuss about property rights, it's not a corruption. It's much more severe business. It's it's, it's really racketeering. Yeah, as as uh, as on corruption, as on corruption, uh, there are numerous facts uh, that uh, different uh, uh, government officials or governors or members of the parliament and uh, they, they 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 use budgetary money for their own uh, profits for their own benefits. I would not say that it is. Um, growing, definitely it's not becoming better, but it, there is no uh, precise measurement. You cannot say it's better or worse. So it's, it seems to me on corruption as it is, on stealing budgetary money, it's more as, at the same level. At least I have no other evidence. Uh, is crisis a good time? Well, as for example, with this food, <coughs> ban, uh, food ban on food import, yes. For, if you can use this opportunity as a private business, you can use an option, a window, and if you have ability to increase, if you have some spare capacities, you may increase production of cheese by 15%. But if you have no spare capacity, you need to invest. You need to take a loan. You need to purchase some equipment that is not produced in Russia, from the west, from the, I don't know, from the east, from the south. And, uh, to, to, and that is, uh, that here as a businessman you face uh, dilemma. Should I invest? Because I start investment process at the moment, the results of this investment will be two or three years, I don't know, one and a half, 18, 24 months later. Do I, I, am I sure that the result of the investment will be will belong to me? Or someone will come and pick up the, 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 the property from me? And that is that's that's why for private business, for, for small business, for individual business, for business on the micro level, it may be an opportunity. It may be an opportunity, but you have to decide: should you risk or not? As 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 to the government, as to the government, and I think that Vladimir Mao and uh, Alexei Ulykaev, the Minister of Economy, uh, when they discuss the crisis as a time for opportunity, they discuss about some macro fundamental reforms. I I stated many times, and uh, I think that many of experts may agree with me: uh, there is no economic solutions for the current Russian crisis. Neither Minister of Economy, nor Minister of Finance, nor Central Bank, nor all together of them can do something to change property rights protection. It's not an economic issue. It's fundamental institutional issues of the government. It is political issue. It is political issue and it is based, it, it, it is not even the area of responsibility of the Russian government. According to the Constitution, according to the legislation, this is the responsibility of the President. And the President is not going to uh, implement independent court system in Russia. Why? He is not going to implement uh, political competition in Russia. Why? Because the next day he is going to start the process of losing the power. He cannot be sure that he is able to keep power as long as he can, as he wish, if there is fair political competition, if there are independent courts. And that's why I, I do not trust, I do not trust that this crisis will provide some real reform agenda for the Russian government. And, yeah. yeah, let me just uh, add a little bit here. Uh, first Deputy Prime Minister Igor Shuvalov, before the, uh, when the 2008 crisis started, he said uh, uh, jubilantly that this gives us opportunity to do reform. And then half a year later he said, unfortunately we couldn't do any reforms because there was a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> this time he has learned of his uh, prior mistake. He's a smart guy. Uh, and so he has not talked about any reforms. So, so we don't even hear any statement about uh, reforms apart from uh, what Sergei mentioned, a certain easing of a small uh, and medium-sized enterprise. And I totally agree with Sergei that this is not... Um, one more point on corruption. Uh, it's interesting with uh, sanctioning of uh, Putin's key cronies, uh, Gennady Timchenko and Arkady Rotenberg, Forbes' assessment of a fortune in a year has fallen by 60%. Timchenko from $11 billion something to $4 billion 
eh, dollars och Rosenberg från 5 billion to 2 uh, billion uh, dollars. Så uh, uh, so, um, this seems to have had some impact because I think that these Forbes assessments are uh, reasonably accurate. Mm -hmm. Maxime, would you like to add anything about the corruption and private property sector? No, but I mean, I think uh, I can just sum it up and say that uh, fighting uh, corruption, uh, sort of using best practices, world world best practices, think of Singapore or other countries that were successful in uh, doing this, it is impossible under current regime. They contradict each other. You cannot. You simply cannot even start doing it because uh, you sort of have to uh, fight your own system uh, by, uh, you know, you have to divide within, whereas the Russian system is all about actually being one uh, to, to, to change uh, government from within. You need to create some body like what they did in other places in, in places that were serious about changing uh, some kind of anti-corruption bureau, whatever you call it, but uh, it has to have real powers uh, to prosecute uh, high-ranking officials, uh, period. If you don't do that, you cannot deal with it. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it rots from, uh, from the head. And when no, when everyone knows that these people high uh, um, in in the high quarters, they uh, they use the opportunities and this the way they they act. I mean, they don't have any incentive even to try uh, anti-corruption policies. So it's uh, under the current system. It's just they don't live together. You 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 don't. It's not wise even to discuss it. It, it it's a, it's for the future. I have to correct myself. Sergei shows me here that uh, Shovalov said in Davos uh, last week that the, cri that the crisis offered, offered an opportunity for reforms, but once, not that once again. <laughs> this was uh, done in Davos. I should also add here that he says exactly like me that he thinks that this crisis will be deeper and last longer than in 2008. So I have uh, Shovalov's uh, support in this matter. <laughs> But he also said that we should eat less. <laughs> he said that. That's a good advice. Yeah. <laughs> she said we are ready. Russians are ready to eat less. <laughs> uh, Wayne Mary from the American Foreign Policy Council. I'd like to return for a moment to SWIFT, because another prominent Russian at Davos, uh, Andrei Kostin, uh, BTB, uh, was actually rather apocalyptic in his comments about uh, the, what it would mean for Russia if it was removed from SWIFT. Uh, he did, said it would be the equivalent of an act of war. Uh, and he indicated, uh, perhaps uh, with authorization from the Kremlin, that there would be a political level response to that. My understanding also from the Chinese is the Chinese financial institutions, the big banks, are not at all interested in trying to provide a substitute for Russia because they're becoming now, uh, they're looking to become real international financial institutions and they don't want to put any of that at hazard uh, by getting involved in potential uh, issues that involve Western sanctions. So to me, the idea that Russia would become like Iran in terms of international payments uh, is actually fairly substantial. Uh, it's the kind of thing that would affect not just uh, institutions like BTB, it would affect uh, everybody who's got an account in Sparebank, it would affect everybody who's got a credit card, it would affect everybody who wants to go to uh, Cyprus for a vacation. Uh, I'm just, I'm a little skeptical at, uh, at how sort of blasé has been there, the comments from the panel so far about about SWIFT. I mean, I'm myself skeptical that it's going to happen because I think most of the European governments are going to make sure, including the European Central Bank, are going to make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, but, to, but I would like to uh, ask people to, to respond a little bit to what uh, Costine was saying in Davos, uh, indicating that from Moscow's perspective, the question of SWIFT is, would be actually a, a major threshold 
in terms of Russian Western uh, economic uh, uh, adversarial relations? Uh, I would not pay a lot of attention to what Mr. Kostin said because he is finally not an official representative. But recently, maybe yesterday or the day before yesterday, the Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said as well, if there are swift sanctions, we will respond. We will respond severe and immediately. Uh, a little bit of technique. Uh, what is SWIFT? SWIFT is a method of communication between banks. They send uh, payment orders one to another like an internet. It's another system, it's, but it's organized on channels and you receive immediately payment orders 24-7. Uh, what is Iranian sanctions? Iranian sanctions means Iranian banks are prohibited to, or okay, not Iranian banks, American banks are prohibited to keep correspondent accounts and run any operations for Iranian financial institutions. That means no payment despite SWIFT, Telex, Fax, Mail, I don't know, Oral, cannot go through American banks. And it's a big difference. Yeah? Iranian sanctions means that Iranian banks cannot pay in dollars via American banks. They cannot pay in euros via European banks. Yeah? They can pay in rubles via Russian banks. They can invent some schemes paying in rubles, via, uh, paying in dollars via Russian banks uh, with corresponding account hidden somewhere. Theoretically, it's possible, but it's very painful if, for example, recently one of French banks was discovered uh, violating uh, Iranian sanctions and paid a huge fine. Yeah, so I do, I do not believe that Russian banks are ready to do it. So, and that is the basic difference. Iranian sanctions means that if they are imposed, that no one Russian bank can run payments in dollars. And of course, that will affect credit card holders, it will affect everyone. And that's why those sanctions will not be imposed. Because those sanctions will be against the whole Russian population, not whole, but 20, 25% of Russian population. And it will be, it will, of course, it will be a catastrophe, catastrophe for, for a Russian economy, maybe, no, not maybe, definitely. Yeah, but I doubt, I doubt it's like a use of nuclear weapon. Yeah, just immediately, just with no uh, preventive uh, words. Uh, SWIFT sanctions, they do not influence credit card payments. So it is another system, it's another way of communication or changing information. And even if banks are not using SWIFT, they can transact all, pay all transactions, uh, settle all payments in credit cards. What really SWIFT affects, it affects ability of banks to run uh, fi uh, transactions on financial markets. So you cannot pay, you cannot participate in the foreign exchange transactions in the forex market yeah, because it, it should be done immediately. Your payment should be done go immediately. You are not prohibited, but you, you cannot play in the securities, in bonds markets, in uh, stocks market, in equity markets because you cannot run immediate transactions. And that's why you have to use brokers, you spend time and you lose money. It creates some problems but it's not Iranian type of sanctions and it's not prohibition and it's not prohibition of any of overall payments of the Russian economy. So anything to add? Uh, yeah, maybe just a little. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's actually, it, it's not on the technical side of uh, the issue, but, you know, just uh, try and think uh, how uh, policymakers let's say foreign, foreign policymakers have to deal with this situation. Russia, if Russia continues to escalate, uh, I mean, on this side, on the Western side, you have to do something, you know, just you have to, because uh, it's politically, you have to do it. So there's a certain list, we don't know what, uh, what exactly is, is on this list, of responses that you can possibly, that you can afford, let's say, on the Western side. And SWIFT is, on this list, so it it just may come to this simply because if if Russia continues to escalate, just just the nature of the process is like this, and uh, unfortunately, it's inexorable. If 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 we don't find together the kind of solution that uh, finally gets everyone at the table and people start start to discuss the issue in a constructive way, this it will come to swift and probably more than that. Thank you. Very well then.
on Stanley Kober. In 1998, Russia defaulted, sent shock waves throughout the global financial system. Yesterday, you might have noticed, Greece sided with Russia on the EU sanctions, said it was not going along with the sanctions. Greece is also saying it's not going to repay its debts. They have to be renegotiated. There is a threat of default. The Germans have said they could deal, these are the stories, they could deal with a Greek default. But what if you had back-to-back -back defaults? They wouldn't have to be coordinated, just back-to-back. -back. What would be the impact on the Eurozone? Back-to-back -back default, both of Russia and Greece? Yes. Oh, let's once again discuss about terms. Default is an ability uh, of the borrower to repay its debts. Yeah, Russian official debt is minor. And the government debt of Russia is less than 10% of GDP. And uh, it seems to me the first big payment that is $3.5 billion, it's enormous payment, it is scheduled for 2017. So until then, until then, all the payments of Russian Ministry of Finance, they are in rubles. And uh, so it's uh, up to now, the budgetary situation is rather comfortable for, uh, for Ministry of Finance, and I doubt that they are going to default having the huge reserve funds. So I do, uh, I, I do not, I do not believe, I do not believe, I do not believe that Russia as, as a government is going to default because there is no significant pressure, neither for the budget nor for the balance of payments on the side of official payments. On, on the corporate debt, on the corporate debt, uh, if we uh, get uh, uh, data, if we slice this debt, we will discover that approximately 30% of this debt is owned by banks, uh, is uh, issued by banks, and another 70% by the rural sector, and out of the rural sector, maybe two-thirds or maybe even 73 fourths, 75% uh, is issued by uh, producers of uh, raw materials, means by exporters. And uh, they, they have uh, hard currency proceeds from export, and they're going to repay those debts. Uh, at least I, I never heard that any of Russian exporters said we are in bad financial position, we are not able to repay our debts. Moreover, devaluation of the ruble uh, helped them to reduce uh, the dollar-denominated costs of production, they are in, in profits, and uh, what I see uh, is on news flow that many of Russian steel producers, they promised to pay higher dividends than before, despite world market prices for iron ore or steel have declined. And so uh, it's it's to, to, to my mind to my mind it's uh, it's unrealistic to discuss it is at the moment that Russia is going to default. Uh, the default of Greece, of course, it will affect it will affect uh, European economy mostly European financial institutions, banks, and insurance company, and uh, some pension funds. But uh, I I think that it will be absorbed by uh, European monetary authorities without significant effect because the bulk of this debt is owned by institutional holders and they are not going to, to trade with this debt even if the default is going to take place tomorrow. Yeah, uh, let me sort out this uh, a little bit more. Uh, Russia 98, it was about $70 billion uh, that Russia defaulted on. The, the, uh, the reason why it had such a big effect was that it was unexpected, so therefore people did not know who was being hit. So, uh, uh, the faster it happens, the worse it is. When Argentina defaulted at the end of 2001, it was uh, $50 billion. There was no reaction at all on world markets because everybody had expected this for a couple of years. Uh, and if you take the Greek situation now, it says, um, Sergei said that uh, everybody knows that uh, Greece is unreliable uh, on, on the market. Essentially all this debt, or almost all of it, is with the ECB and the, the European Union institutions. So it's isolated from the markets. It does not influence any European uh, banks in any significant way. If it had been in 2010, uh, then uh, German and French banks uh, would have taken a big blow. No, they won't. They have got rid of uh, their uh, Greek um, uh, papers. So um, 
if Greek defaults, so much for, for Greece, uh, the market will uh, say now, and uh, whatever uh, policy Syriza has on Russia, as uh, Sergei uh, explained, it won't uh, uh, matter much since uh, the Russian government is not in the market. Thank you. Time for one more question. Uh, Andrea Larian of Gate Institute. <coughs> uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one seems to me it is rather striking that none of the speakers today has ever mentioned Russian Ukrainian war as a factor that can influence or already has influenced the economic dynamics in Russia. Uh, the question is. It's true it is not important factor in the past year, in this year, in the coming time. So the second question, <clears throat> um, among some differences between Russian speakers and others, if I did not miss anything, that Russian speakers did not mention, if I did not miss anything, uh, the factor of sanctions. And Anders puts a lot of uh, importance to the fact of sanctions. Uh, so it's a coincidence, or the Russian side does not see sanctions, at least the Western sanctions, uh, the problem for economic uh, performance. And Anders, for you, could you please elaborate a little bit your point about sanctions? Just about a week ago, uh, President Obama has said in his State of the Union address uh, two contradicting statements at the same time. He said that he is some kind of cancelling these embargo sanctions against Cuba because for 50 years it turned out that they happened to be ineffective. And at the same time, some sanctions that have been introduced against Russia that were in place for several months were so effective that they put the Russian economy in tatters. So it's rather hard to comprehend logically uh, that uh, almost total sanctions uh, against rather small economy with monoculture uh, specialities for 50 years did not produce any result and this kind of very limited sanctions against some particular uh, personalities and companies even not for the full operations working for a very short period of time for much larger economy and not very many c countries are participating that did produce such a tremendous impact. How it's possible to solve this puzzle and what kind of arguments you would uh, use to argue that sanctions really uh, do produce definitely more harm for Russian economy than the, for example, the war against Ukraine, since you did mention it. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, sorry for not mentioning the Russian-Ukrainian war. When I talk about financial sanctions, it's of course because of the Russian-Ukrainian war. So uh, I didn't no, no, no. think that I needed to, no, no, no. Uh, to to clarify that. No, direct, direct impact of the Russian actions, not of the Western actions against Russia, but the war itself. I don't think that it has a major uh, financial uh, uh, impact in uh, these regards. It has is a certain cost, but. Uh, I have not looked uh, closely at it, but uh, say that we are discussing $10 billion a year or something like that, uh, uh, and uh, that's not a big uh, big chunk uh, in, in the context. Uh, on the uh, sanctions, um, uh, my colleagues at the Peterson Institute, Gary Huffbauer and Jeffrey Schott, have uh, written uh, a book on uh, economic sanctions revisited. I think they've done three editions. Uh, of it where they have summed up uh, the empirical inf uh, effect of uh, all kinds of sanctions after the Second, uh, Second World War. And there are a number of very striking conclusions in it. 30% uh, of the sanctions are successful. So most sanctions are not successful. Uh, sanctions are more successful if they have a limited target. In this case, uh, uh, getting uh, Russia out of uh, Ukraine or uh, uh, limiting the war in Ukraine. They are unsuccessful if it's a matter of regime change. Read Cuba. 
uh, so if you want to have a regime change, uh, uh, sanctions is not uh, the means. They are more successful if more countries uh, are participating in it, uh, uh, which is the reason why the administration is so anxious uh, to uh, cooperate with the uh, European Union. Uh, and of course, here, much of the Russia sanctions are modeled on the Iranian sanctions that have not been successful as yet, but seem to have softened the attitude. Uh, an additional conclusion is that sanctions are most uh, successful when they are being threatened with, or when they are being finished with. While, while they are underway, it's difficult to say that they uh, are very uh, effective. And um, we know that the Cuban sanctions have not been successful since they have lasted for so long and not given the desired results. With regard to the Russia uh, sanctions, it remain, uh, remains uh, to, be, uh, to be seen. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, just, uh, I, I, I really it. when I said if Russia continues to escalate, I actually meant, me, meant in Ukraine, sort of thinking it was obvious, but yeah, I'm sorry I didn't say that. Uh, I didn't mention it a lot. I didn't mention uh, revolution of 1917. I didn't mention uh, uh, Christianization of Russia. I didn't mention many things in my uh, presentation, so I, I was limited to time, Andrei. And of course, of course, uh, uh, I, I anticipated that the uh, people here in this auditorium they know well about sanctions, and they know what the sanctions exist, and uh, they know that sanctions uh, uh, create certain impact on the Russian economy. But as well, it seems to me I haven't mentioned, for example, fall in oil price. Yeah, that is, in fact, it's much more, uh, Anders has mentioned, but not me, that is, uh, my creates my, uh, much more significant pressure on Russian economy, Russian balance of payments. But both, uh, the, the sanctions, sanctions do exist, and of course they do exist because of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, and I have to agree with Anders that direct impact on the Russian economy of, uh, of the war, uh, if not about, if we do not talk about sanctions, but it only uh, of the war, is next to nothing. Uh, maybe even some some increase in military production, so uh, some, some some armaments, but not 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 great, not great, because uh, it is hybrid war that uh, uh, that is going to take that's taking place on the territory of Ukraine, unfortunately, and uh, uh, Russia does not suffer from any military actions or from a, a, a anything. Uh, uh, Russian Russian economy as it is, uh, sanctions sanctions uh, are important. Sanctions are important. And uh, they uh, they are important in 2015 and 2016 mostly, because these financial sanctions that, that prohibit Russian banks and companies, in fact, uh, to, to borrow any new money in the Western markets and in Chinese and Eastern markets as well, because neither Chinese banks nor Singapore nor uh, Hong Kong, no one is ready to lend to Russia, because no one, despite, despite, though there are no official sanctions in China against Russia, but Chinese banks, they are not going to provide any new credits to Russia. Sanctions are important, and uh, the, according to the schedule of the repayment of the foreign debt, the huge, the biggest payments, they are in 2015 and 16. Afterwards, and then pressure of the foreign debt repayment is declining. So if, if Russia continues the war, uh, in uh, 2017 and 18, the impact of financial sanctions will be much less. But we discussed only 2015, and I said when I mentioned that uh, the pressure, the, the reduction in import by 40 to 60 percent, it included the, sanction, the effect of sanctions like the repayment of the debt. So that's it. And uh, the effect of uh, sanctions uh, on uh, oil and gas sector seems to be negligible in 2015, starting to emerge in 2016, and by 2018, the decline in oil production may reach something like 5% because of the technological sanctions. Thank you, and we'll take about a 10-minute ten, uh, ten break, continue with our second panel, discussing in a wider. If you please uh, join me in thanking our uh, wonderful panelists. Those who are leaving, we're also having an event tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. in this room. Uh, we're going to discuss frozen conflicts, including the possible freezing of the Ukrainian conflict.